Reflection is another fancy programming term. It doesn't have anything to do with reflections on metallic surfaces, rather it allows your code to be much more dynamic. In this tutorial, I will walk you through four various examples where you can use reflection to save yourself a lot of time. I already told you that using reflection you can write more dynamic code, so what does this mean? Well, most of the time when you are programming, you declare the type of something up front so that the computer knows the type at the compile time. This is called static programming. With dynamic programming, however, the type is not known from start and the code itself decides what the type is going to be. In short, what reflection means is that we are working with types of something and we are calling some function on the type itself. The most common way how we can get type of something is using the type of keyword and then we just need to pass in the type. So this line is going to get us the type of enemy AI and we can store it in a variable which will be of type type which is stored inside of the system namespace. So this is one way of getting the type from something when you just explicitly declare the type or what you may want to use at runtime is just getting the type from some object. So in this case we could create some variable storing the enemy AI and then we could get the type directly from the enemy AI using the getType function. When we take a look at the functions that we can call on the type, you will see that there is really a ton of them and these are most of the functions that you are using when working with reflection. Now as you understand the basic principles behind reflection, let's take a look at a practical example where we will be creating instances of classes, but not this old way, which is just having to create each class on a new line, which can be really annoying if you want to add more classes later, but it will allow us to create the classes dynamically without having to specify their type. This example I'm using right now is the one that we created in the state machine tutorial, so feel free to check it out. What this is supposed to do is that we have an enemy AI, which has three different states that the enemy can be in. In the enemy AI script, we then have some variables for the enemy, and mainly, we have variables referencing each of these states. You can imagine that as we would be adding more states later, it would be really annoying because you need to add new line for each of these states. So if you would have, I don't know, 20 of them, you would have 20 lines declaring each of these states. So what we'll achieve using the reflection is that we won't need to have references for any of these states. We'll just call a function getState on a factory class that we'll create, which is then going to provide us the state we ask it for. Let's create a new script, which I will call StateFactory. What the state factory class is going to be doing is that we ask it to give us some state and it's going to either create the state or if it has already created the state object sometime in the past, it's just going to give it to us. So for this, we should have some dictionary which will be storing the type of the state and then the reference to the object itself, which is just some I enemy state. So that later, if some class wants to get the same state we have already created, we'll just grab it from the dictionary instead. The function to get the state should retrieve us some i enemy state and it's going to be generic so that we can pass any type inside of it and it's going to get us the state of that type. We also need to limit the t, which is the generic parameter, to only be inheriting from i enemy state so that we don't get anything else than i enemy state and because we'll also be creating the state instances inside of this function, we would not really be able to pass any parameters into it we also need to limit it so that it has an empty constructor. This way, creating of each of these state's objects will be really as simple as just creating it, because we don't need to pass in any parameters. And this is the place where we are going to get the type. So I'm getting the state type using the type of t, which then we are using to check in the dictionary whether we have already a state of this type. If we have it, then we can just return it. And finally, if we don't find the state in the dictionary, we can just create new instance of it. In this case, it is really simple, as they are all following the same interface, so we can create some i enemy state, and then we can just add it into the dictionary and return it. This way it is going to work really well, but what if we are not using a generic function, so we don't have the type t here, but instead we want to pass the type as an argument to the getState function. In that case, we cannot just say new state type, that doesn't work. So instead, we will use the activator, which is used only to create instances of a type. We are calling the function create instance and passing in the type. So this way, we are utilizing the reflection. 
At a first glance, it may seem that the first way of doing this is always better than the second one. But what if you need to pass some parameters into the constructor? With interfaces, you cannot do that because interfaces cannot contain constructors. But how we can do this is again using the create instance function and we can pass in the arguments as objects into the array. But still, you need to make sure that you pass all of the arguments the constructor needs and that you also pass them in the correct order. In this case, we don't need this. I just now noticed that in the state factory, we don't need the constructor and we also don't need to be storing the enemy AI variable, so it is quite simple like this. How this is going to simplify things for the enemy AI is that, well, we won't need to be storing references to each of the states because they will be provided by the factory. So we can create a variable storing the state factory and just initialize it. And then the main function I'm using to set the states is the set state function. So here we won't be requesting a parameter as the enemy state. Instead, we'll just make it generic as well and get the type this way. So again, the same way we need to limit this function to only take in types of T which inherit from the I enemy state and which have empty constructors. And then we can just get the state from the state factory and enter the state as usual. So now if at start I want to set the state to the wonder enemy state, I'm not passing this as a parameter. Instead, I use the generic parameter and I just pass in wonder enemy state. And that's it. So you can see the first really useful use case for the reflection is when you need to dynamically create some objects. So in this case, when I want to add some more states to the enemies, I don't really need to change any logic inside of the enemy AI script, because this one has the generic function set state, which can really set it to anything that's inheriting from I enemy state. And here we don't have the references for each of these states, so it's really much cleaner. You can check out my Patreon, where I have some videos for my supporters, and also some other free stuff such as the project files and so on. Recently I have released a tutorial about the service locator where the first part was free here on YouTube and the second part is on the Patreon for supporters where I will show you how you can add contexts into the service locator so you will have contexts like game object, scene and project context and together all of this makes the service locator really a powerful tool so check it out. Now for the second example as for where you can use reflection can be really useful if you need to select some types because you know that if you make a variable of type type you cannot assign anything to it in the inspector because it's just not a suizable type. So what we'll create will be a custom editor script which will allow us to select some type in the inspector. You can see that right now I'm filtering the types to be only the types that are inheriting from the I enemy type. So the way that I'm doing this is that I have the type selector class, which really doesn't have much. I'm just storing the selected type, which obviously we cannot see in the inspector, because this is not suizable. And the same way I have a variable storing the filter type, which right now I set to the I enemy state. But if I set it to null, then you will see it in the inspector is going to be showing me all of the types that are available. And yep, now we have a long list of all of the types. So this again could be really useful for the state pattern where we need to select some starting state. So we could have a list of all of the I enemy states and just choose from that one. You could have seen that the type selector script itself doesn't have any logic related to selecting of the types. All of that is stored inside of the editor which I have. So make sure that if you use this script it is placed inside of a folder called exactly editor. And the script itself is the type selector editor. If you haven't created custom editors yet, this will be something new for you. You can also check my tutorial about them. So in short, we just made it a custom editor of the type type selector. It is inheriting from the editor. And then we have a bunch of logic related to selecting of the types. We have a few variables here. Then the two main functions, which are the on enable and the on inspector GUI, which gets run when we just move our mouse over the inspector and so on. So first, on enable, we are just getting the assembly, which this one is stored inside of the system.reflection. And why we need to get the assembly? Well, because we want to get all of the types. And all of the types are stored inside of some assembly, so it is important that we first know from which assembly we want to get all of the types. So we are using the assembly.load function. This one takes in the name of the assembly, in most cases, this is going to be assembly C-sharp, which is the basic assembly. 
So then we can get all the types from the assembly just by calling the get types function on it. You will notice that on the assembly, we also have many more functions we can use. But in this case, we want to get all of the types from the assembly and then filter out through them so that we only show the types that the user is interested in. So I'm getting the types from the assembly. Then we are using a bit of link. So I have added using system.link. We are just going through all the types and including only the ones where the T, so the type is class and it is not abstract, which means that we don't want to show abstract classes and interfaces because those cannot really do anything. They cannot be instantiated and we cannot really use them. But still, there may be cases when you want to use abstract classes and interfaces. In this case, I'm just not including them. And also, if you would want to filter it out further, you can notice that from the type, again, there's a bunch of stuff you can get, including all the functions we have covered previously. Then I'm getting the type selector, which is the script on which we have the editor. So this is done using the target and casting it as the type selector. Then I'm checking if the filter type is not now. If it is now, then we can really straight get the type names, which is the variable we have here. So I go into the assembly types. And again, I'm using some link to select only the full names and convert them into the array. So that later we can use the type names and show them in the long list. Otherwise, if we are using some filter type, then we need to filter out through the assembly types a bit more. So in this case, I'm checking where, so going through all the assembly types, and what we want to make sure that the filter type we selected is assignable from T. This means that the filter type is going to be like some abstract class or some interface. So we only want to include classes that can be assigned as the interface or the abstract class. So if we have some class implementing the interface, this can be assigned as the interface. So that's why we are using this really handy function. And then again, we can convert it into the array. And again, I'm getting the names. You can notice that in this case, when we are filtering only through some of the specific types, I'm only including the name, which is actually name of the script or the class. So this would be the attack enemy state, follow enemy state and wander enemy state. But when I'm showing all of the types, so when we are not filtering through any of them, I'm showing the full name and the full name also includes the namespace, which can be quite important when you are filtering through all of the elements so that you can choose the right one. And lastly, we need to know which index we selected. Then in the function on inspector GUI, I'm just adding some label. This is optional. I'm drawing the pop-up. So it's the long list that we see into which we need to pass in the selected index as well as all the options we can choose from. And then there is just a bit of checking so that we can assign the selected type into the selector. And we also need to set the selector as dirty, which will just update all the changes. And then I'm just drawing the default inspector to make sure that we see all of the other stuff we should see there. So that's it for the type selector editor we have. You can see the editor is not too long. There is some advanced functionality inside of it. But I was quite amazed with what the reflection can do because selecting the types in the inspector is really a powerful feature. And if you are wondering whether Unity is using reflection somewhere, you can be sure that it is using reflection in many places. For example, if you go into the edit project settings and you go into the script execution order, which is just the execution order of each of the scripts. Here, if you try to add some script, you will also notice the same window that we have pretty much created on our own, which is showing all of the types that we have in our project. Let's take a look at the third example, which can be used for loading some plugins, because what the reflection allows you to do is to call even private functions. So in this case, if you are loading a plugin, we could load it from the assembly, load the file, then we could get the type of the plugin and we could call some functions on it. So if you know name of the function, we can get the method from the plugin type. Then we can get some instance of the plugin. So again, we are using the activator to create the instance of the plugin type. And lastly, we are invoking the method on the instance of the plugin. In this one, you can also pass in the object array of the parameters. And mainly you can call even private functions. So if you have some code that you cannot modify, such as if you have downloaded some plugin, or maybe you want to call some function in the Unity code that is private, 
then you can use the assembly. What you should definitely not be doing is making all your functions private and calling them through the reflection, because usually when you make a function private, you expect that no scripts are going to access it and use it, so you should really keep it the way without reflection if it is possible. So if a function is private, do not call it from anywhere else. If it is public, you can call it, but the reflection for calling the private functions can definitely have its use cases. The fourth and the final example of using reflection I have prepared could be some dynamic save system. So let's say that you have multiple scripts or some complex database that is really holding a ton of fields on each of the classes and you want to be able to save all of them. For sure, we could have some function where you would be just going through each of these fields, saving the data. But if you really need to do it dynamically for all the fields you have, we can also use reflection. So inside of the save system, we could have a function save object state, which would just require some object. And then from the object, we are getting the type as usual. Then we are using the function get fields, which will just get us all of the fields. If we don't specify any of the binding flags I have here, it will get you only the public fields. In some cases, you may want to save only the public ones, in some cases, even the private. In this case, I am including the binding flags to tell it that I want to save the public, non-public, and only the instances to make sure it is not saving any static variables. And what you see here is the bitwise or operator, which just allows us to say whether it is this or this or this. If you want to learn more about bitwise operators, I also have a tutorial about them. And finally, we could go through each of the fields that we have stored inside the field info array, and we could just get the value from each of the fields, and we could save it into JSON or in some database. And the same way, we could go about loading the state of the object. So we require the object, we get all of the fields that the object requires. Then again, we'll go through all of the fields, and we would need to load the value for each of the fields somewhere. Let's imagine that you then build hundreds of scripts where you have some important data you need to save. Then you can imagine that the save system could be really handy in that case, because you would not need to write some safe logic for each of these scripts, but you can just use those two functions for it and just tell it where it should save the data, fine tune it and it should all work. You may not be using reflection too often, but still it is a really handy feature to know about because in some cases it can help you to make your code much more maintainable and extensible, so it can even help you to automate quite a lot of things and just make your life a lot easier for you. Because in the first example of these states, if you would want to add hundreds of states for some reason, we would need to have hundreds of lines defining each of these states, but using reflection, we really just need the one function and the factory, and as we are adding more states, we don't really need to care about that logic. So in this case, it could make your life a lot simpler. The same way, if selecting the types in the inspector, that's a way how we can adjust the unity workflow to make it a lot better for us. And with the save system, it is the same way. It can really help you to save hundreds of lines of code and tens of hours of your time. I hope that I helped you to understand reflection and that you now see how really useful it can be in some scenarios. The project files will be on the Patreon as well. I hope that this video was useful. If you have any questions or suggestions, drop them down in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and I will see you in next videos. Bye!